My name is Greg. I'm a researcher at Google, and I work for the Android Auto Project. And I'm German Bauer. I'm a designer on the Android Auto team. How are you guys doing? <laughs> and we are going to talk about designing for driving. So German will explain what that actually means. So what we want to do is we want to give you a little bit of an insight of how Android Auto came about, the considerations that went into making it, and how we're supporting developers who might not know even about automotive design in bringing their Android app to this new platform. And then time permitting, we want to talk a little bit about the future as well. OK, so Android Auto, does everybody know what it is? Anybody not know what it is? OK, I think everybody knows. But for those that don't know, it's an extension of Android bringing Android into the car so that you get the apps, the functionality, the features that you want from your phone, but you have it presented in a new manner that's fit for the context of driving. Why are we on, on, on automotive areas? Well, if you heard Sunda this morning talk about the whole larger platform of Android, we're really a big part of that. Android is all about having many touch points into people's lives across devices, not just phones, not just tablets, but also watches, cars, and TV. And for, this is all for over a billion of users and a whole ecosystem on top of it that you developers help us build as well. And together, we make it really like a, a really big thing. And as of today, as at I.O. 2016, we're talking about Android Auto itself becoming um, a platform that has two new form factors in addition to what was already on the market for about a year, um, spanning a wider range of automotive types and actually you know, really becoming an, a system on itself. And the first one, the first form factor I want to talk about is the one that um, we already saw in the photo, which is the by plugging your phone into a compatible car, and then your phone becomes projected directly onto the car's display, and you use the car's control to interact with your content. And so this is powering, the phone is powering the entire experience in this, in this form factor. And as of I.O. 2016, as of today, Android Auto is also previewing a brand new form factor for those cars that are not yet compatible with the plugged-in version of Android. Um, so we're extending it to these older cars. For example, if you have a classic and, and you want to put Bluetooth in, this is a great and your audio experience directly on the phone screen. So you don't need anything else there. And the third thing we want to preview is really a concept of Android as an embedded platform built directly into the car. This is, um, you can see this outside in the, in the red Maserati. Um, there's a preview of that concept there. And it's that car manufacturers can actually build um, their native system on top of Android. And so you're going to get a great experience directly built into the car. And what we're super thrilled to see as, as you know, having built the system is finally realizing this bigger vision of Android Auto being running across all these different platforms and translating the UI depending on the screen form factor, depending on the input devices that you have. And I think this is something that we are super excited about. And Greg is now shedding more light on why driving is really so different than using a regular phone in a regular context. Right. So when we, go, when we move into new spaces, it's really important to take the context of the environment into account. When we look at driving today, we see that we're spending a lot of time inside the car. So from a fairly recent study, they found that the average uh, person in the US spends around 45 minutes inside the car per day. Um, for those of us living in the Bay Area, it's actually probably higher given the traffic volumes that we have out here. But either way, that's somewhere on the magnitude of around 280 hours per year inside the car. It's a lot of time. And it's a, lot of, it's a big piece of our life. Um, and what we find is that during that time, people don't want to necessarily stop their digital life. So they want to still be able to be entertained, they want to communicate, and they want to be productive. And if we can't find out, or we, if we can't figure out the right way to convey the information, then it leads to problems. So as an example, texting. We, we all know that texting isn't good. Um, a study found that, or they, they noted at highway speeds, 
uh, when you text and drive, it's approximately equivalent to driving the length of a football field while not looking at the roadway. So it's not good. And we know we, that we shouldn't do it, yet we also know that people are still doing it. Um, so the question is, why? Well, one reason is that we tend to overestimate our driving abilities. So as drivers, we're generally overconfident, and we, we tend to try and we don't understand the true dangers. So basically, we, we're overconfident with our abilities, and we also underestimate the true dangers of driving. This leads to a pretty bad mix, because when we want to engage with, um, uh, when we want to be productive or communicate or be entertained, um, it means that we, we start to, uh, uh, we start to engage in, with our phone or do things that we shouldn't necessarily do. Um, and the problem is when we're driving, if we screw up, if you do something stupid, you don't just put yourself at risk, but you put all those, the others in the car with you at risk, and you put those around you at risk as well. So it's really critical that we figure out how can we re-examine the technology to better suit the environment. Didn't you, in fact, have a statistic where you said that the majority of drivers um, think they are better than average drivers, which is actually mathematically impossible? Yeah. Yeah, it was somewhere around, I think it was 93% of those sampled thought they were above average drivers. And the, rest, and the rest was probably statistic experts that realized that it yeah. wasn't possible. Um, so from this point, it's really, really clear that the phone, designing for the phone, is not the same thing as designing for driving. Really two different things. I think Greg has made abundantly clear with the three points that he just made that it's a very different situation. And this different environment need to be thought of as such when we start about designing um, apps and services for this environment. Right. And one thing to note is it's not necessarily the phone's fault. Right? If you go into a car dealership today and you look at the technology that's going inside the car, it's, a lot of them resemble tablets and phones right now. Um, so it's not necessarily the technology, but again, it's the way that the, the information is constructed and ultimately conveyed that's the critical elements. And so for Android Auto, and this is what this talk is about, the experience needs to be designed specifically for driving. And what this means, we're going to start with the next few slides. So for one thing, one easy way that we can think of this is that really drive, driving and keeping your eyes on the road is task number one. And dealing with the phone should be task number two. Um, and this is very different than, than phones where we design apps specifically for whole engagement, for full engagement. And here, we actually want to do it differently because we don't want you to spend um, this much time with your eyes off the road. Right. And another way to think about this is if you s substitute primary task for driving and your secondary task is a distraction. So all other activities inside the car that don't pertain to driving are, in fact, distracting. And we find that people engage in distracting activities quite a lot. So there's a recent study that looked at naturalistic driving data and found that over 50% of the time, people engage in distracting activities. These, this can be anything from texting, as we talked about before, but it can also be eating or conversing with the passenger or even dancing in your car seat. So all of this, if it doesn't pertain to driving, it has some element of distraction for the driving task. When we look at distraction itself, we can break it down from the human perspective. And we see that ultimately it can be thought of in three main fundamental ways. So we have visual distraction. This is, of course, when your eyes are off the road looking at other things. We can have manual distraction. And this is when your hands are off the steering wheel or off steering controls, uh, fidgeting with other things like the climate control. Then we can have cognitive distraction. This one's a little bit harder to assess, but it's basically when your mind is not actively thinking about the driving task and it's attending to other things. And in the real world, we, we, don't, we rarely see a task that takes just one form of distraction. Most often, tasks have some element of all of these types of distraction. So if we use an example, something as simple as rolling up the window. In order to determine if you need to roll up the window, you might have to glance 
at the window, so there's some visual. Uh, you have to reach over to the button, of course, so there's some manual distraction. And then you have to think about maybe, do I need to push or do I need to pull on it? So this is a really simplified example, and of course, the levels of distraction here aren't really critical. Uh, but it, it's a good representation, and it's a good, uh, it, it helps us to understand when we're designing experiences, we need to uh, figure out how can we uh, focus the experience, how do the experiences affect each of the different channels of distraction, and ultimately, how can we minimize the overall distraction. And what we know is that we can't fully eliminate it. Distraction is always going to exist in some form inside the car. Uh, but what we can do is we can mi mitigate it through responsible design. So then how do we fundamentally rethink how we design the UI for driving um, away from the interaction model that we know from the handheld? And what I want to do is actually share a few principles with you that have come about as we did a lot of research and a lot of design iterations. And um, let's talk about those. So one. One simple principle that is sort of one of the foundations for Android Auto is that we're really trying to biasing things towards action. What does this mean? So when you're on your phone and you're trying to play music, for example, you have a selection of multiple apps. You select your app. And then you have maybe a grid of like uh, def different suggested things. The song, the song you have might not be in there. You're scrolling down a list, maybe possibly another list. And that's a lot of noodling before you actually get to play a song. Compare this with the old style auto radio, if you still remember those from way back when. Um, we just press any of the buttons, and out comes music. It's really simple. Or you put it in a CD or a cassette, and it just works. And this is sort of the gold standard in some ways, because you, there's very little load on you. You just start it, and it immediately is actionable, immediately is set up for consumption. And then you can still change from there, you know, the channel, whatever, but it's, it's, it gives you some instant gratification. Right. And then we also want to try and reduce visual and cognitive load by overall simplifying the interface, um, making layouts and content predictable, so making things consistent, and then flattening hierarchies as much as we can to make, to, again, surface actions as quickly as possible. So this really overall just means a reduction in complexity and really focusing on core activities that make sense to do while driving. And keep in mind, for other activities, those can always be deferred to pre- or post-drive states, such as playing with, playing with settings. Um, all of this is done to keep interactions efficient so that you can get the content you want, but then get to dr back to driving as quickly as possible. And for those other tasks where you're looking for very specific content, voice can be a great shortcut. It can be this great deep dive. Um, so if you're looking for that one song that you really want to play, you can simply make a voice command. And this allows you to reroute away from the complexity of going through an interface visually and just make a simple voice command and get it. So we really want to enable voice in all of our apps uh, so that users can take advantage of these shortcuts. And the great thing is about voice is it really doesn't require any visual elements uh, or manual elements for distraction. We're also talking today, if you go over to the booth later on, you'll see that we're working on hot wording so that OK Google will work in the car so that you don't actually have to press a button as well to start your voice session. Now, the other side of this is, though we can alleviate visual and manual distraction, we do have to be aware that voice comes at a cost through cognitive distraction. Because every time you think about what you're going to say, every time you start to speak, and every time you listen, it takes some element of cognitive processing. So we want to carefully design the voice, uh, voice interfaces and the voice flows to try and mitigate cognitive processing and overall cognitive load. So people ask us often, why don't you just use your phone? People are using it today, right? And the phone had 10 years. In the last 10 years, it really evolved to almost like a computing platform of smartphones. And it really has had a long time to optimize its UI. But think about it. When you're driving, your attention is primarily on the road. And your phone will be an arm's length away from you, not close to you. And then finally, if you've ever driven on the American highways around here, you know there's a ton of potholes. And you know what that does to your touch accuracy? 
You know, if you've ever done, tried this on a screen, it's very, very tricky. And then you throw in non-ideal lighting conditions, like today when the car turns, the light comes from this side, then from this side. Sometimes the phone is full of glare and you can't really see anything. And you can't change any of these things, right? And so it becomes clear that we don't have a regular handset situation here. So first of all, typography needs to be significantly larger to see at a distance. The touch targets need to be much more forgiving and bigger. And then finally, the contrast needs to be maximized to work in all the lighting conditions, including night driving. Um, the good news is, with every building blocks that we're making for the OS, um, we're also keeping the developers in mind as we're building this, so you don't have to necessarily sweat all these details. You don't have to be car and driving experts as you're building an app for Android Auto. So a few examples are on the left side, we have font styles that have been extensively tested and optimized for driving use case that developers can call upon. We have layouts and component sizes built for automotive touch target sizes. So all of our layouts are actually built on this sort of metric that allows for these large enough touch targets. And then finally, we have this icon contrast switcher mechanism built into the system where you can provide an icon as an app developer that's one, new, one color, and then we switch the color accordingly to what happens with the background. And this, this happens automatically. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah, so this is uh, the whole field of legibility um, in glanceable environments is actually a super, super interesting area. Um, and what you find is that little tweaks and things like font weight or font size or contrast can actually have quite significant impact on the overall readability and time it takes to understand or read um, text. And so, you know, when we're talking about driving, we're not talking about a matter of seconds. We're really talking a matter of milliseconds here. And every little bit counts. Um, so we're really interested in this type of research. Um, MIT Age Lab and Monotype have both been conducting research in this area for quite some time now. And so we're collaborating with them to conduct collaborative research to, again, investigate these areas of font legibility, um, dynamic lighting environments, font colors, contrast, font size, all of these things, um, to better understand, basically, you know, how does this really affect uh, legibility in a driving context, and how can we further optimize our system to, again, even if it's shaving milliseconds off, let's, let's make those improvements and make driving better. One of the big learnings that we had over time was that we understood that we needed to make our system throughout noble and familiar throughout all its applications. What does this mean? Well, Remember how Greg previously talked about um, cognitive load? And one of the biggest loads is actually that what we refer to as mental loading and unloading of an application model. So that basically refers to the user as they're switching from one app to another. Um, they need to learn and relearn a new model. Sometimes they remember it, of course, when they use it frequently. But there's still unlearning and unlearning going on. And if you're driving, then your mental capacity is already sort of shrunk because your attention, again, is on the road. And so, so it means that for us, it meant that we, meant we wanted this, the system UI to organize it in such a way that the apps are all self-similar. There is recognizable elements in all the apps that even if you switch to another app, it sort of works in the same way. And this is very different from phones, obviously, where every app tries to distinguish itself. And Spotify has a completely different UI than, say, Google Play Music. But for Android Auto, we want to keep this at a minimum so that people don't have to relearn in the situation of driving. So let's look at some wireframes here. Um, this, this is a navigation application on Android Auto. And the wireframe is at the bottom right. This is the phone application. You can see the same system takes place where there is these recognizable elements. And we're going to go through in a second. And this is an audio music application, again, with very, very similar elements. And in the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about these common elements that are th used throughout the system. So we, we basically designed the elements in such a way that they have common functionality no matter which app you're in. And these anchor points are the menu on the left uh, top corner where you get access to alternative content then compared to what you're currently playing. The microphone on the right side, which accesses what we call the demand space, which is basically you can query the system like a, a Google Voice, um, to either do actions or find a specific piece of content. Then the application has its own actions. And this is the white area. 
And the whole system has an activity strip at the bottom where you can switch between the core activities of driving, which we identified as navigation, communication, um, audio and music and entertainment, and then car-specific activities. Now let's look at uh, the case of uh, music applications here. So the first one we saw was Google Play Music, and you can see sort of a very familiar structure with the play, pause button, the forward and, and, and rewind, and you have additional menu on the right side. And this here, this other screen, is a different application. Um, this is an audio app that happens to have a 30-second rewind and a 30-second um, forward. And even though they have slightly different functionality and they express their brand in a different color, it's still fundamentally the same structure that the driver can benefit from. Even if, even if they have never seen this app before, they can reuse that. And you know, when you're at night, driving at night um, has its own specific challenges. And we do a lot of automatic switching of some of the panels and things like that for them to um, reduce the, the overall lighting intensity but you can still re recognize the exact same structure. And we're actually giving the application developers a, a, a way to, to, to notify them that when they are in a low light situation so they, they can switch to a different color palette. This is one of those things that we're doing to make it easier for application developers so they don't have to redo everything themselves. And so today, we're introducing this new form factor um, directly on the phone screen um, and unifying the story for the developers and the overall experience because what you can see here is, is exactly the same structure from a user experience model. Um, even though the form factor is very different and you may not see as many buttons in the white area because, frankly, the screen is smaller and, and you know, is usually in a, in a mount. Um, but it's exactly the same structure otherwise. And this is what this new form factor looks like in, um, for example, for Google Play Music during daytime. In the next screen, we're seeing the same application that we looked at before, the audio app, um, which is right on that next screen. And you can, again, you recognize the same structure over and over again. And finally, at night, um, you can see this here. Um, again, very similar building principles. And even in different applications like the phone application, you make a phone call, this looks immediately familiar because it's, the actions are grouped such that the most important actions are directly front and center and you're immediately in the experience rather than having to navigate through a bunch of menus to actually get to the consumption experience. And then finally, the navigation screen, which is also part and parcel of this experience here on the smaller form factor. And um, you know, this functions in exactly the same way. OK. Then we also want to try and be naturally integrated into the car. So what does that mean exactly? Um, it means that we want to use existing buttons for common functions when we can. So that's things like controlling the volume, skipping track, um, muting or pressing the voice button. So when we can use these buttons, that helps to provide a more seamless experience to the user, helps to reduce learning costs and reduce confusion. So that when the driver steps into the car, he or she doesn't have to guess or relearn. They can just start using it, and it just works. And more than integrated, we also have to adapt to the different technologies inside the car. So if you go to the dealer today, you'll find that technology widely varies across manufacturers, makes, and models. Um, and we need to be able to provide a solution for those. So in the screen that you see, we need to have a solution not only for touchscreen, but we need a solution for, let's see if it switches, there we go, for when it's not a touchscreen. So when it's a rotary knob, or maybe it's a touchpad, or some other interaction method that hasn't yet been released. Um, so this gets to be supremely challenging. Um, and ultimately, what we see is that this field is only getting more complex. You have different screen sizes. And those screens are now, you're seeing different form factors. So some are doing long portrait. Some are stretching wide in the landscape. You have different control types, of course. And the layouts for where technology is going inside the car has also, is also changing. So you're seeing shifts of where information conventionally used to be just in the instrument cluster or just in the head unit. You're now seeing migration of where information is or moving across the inside of the car. Um, and basically, let me just go back, this is a lot of complexity. 
It's a huge amount of complexity, but it's really important that we pay attention to this complexity so that you as developers and designers and makers don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I want to iterate on that point. I think that um, what, what Greg just showed is that you know, you can, you can go outside and look at some of the costs and the differences in screen sizes and all that, but this, you don't have to worry about this because one of the things that we're doing, we're actually translating the UI across these different input and output devices. And, you know, of course, as designers, we could say, well, these guys are crazy. Why are they doing this? You know, we want a uniform UI, and they should all be the same, right? But when you look at costs, they're very expensive. They're very emotional purchases. People pay a lot of money for this stuff. And brand differentiation is really their competitive edge. And you know they're doing this because they want to leapfrog each other. They want to sort of say, we are this brand, and this is our characteristics. And our system basically owes them to adapt and integrate well with that system and be a natural part, as, as Greg was showing before. Like It needs to feel like it's part of that system. And so the good news is that um, Android Auto really takes care of that as far as apps and services are concerned. So you didn't necessarily have to be an automotive expert. And one of the other interesting challenges is that as an ecosystem, of course, we're in many countries, and Android Auto rolls out to many countries. Um, and there are many different locales, regulations, but also driving habits, you know, left side, right side driving, and things like that, that all have to be taken into account. So when you look at this overall complexity, it's actually an, a pretty multi-dimensional problem, where on one side, you have an ecosystem of all apps and services that all want to get on Android Auto. On the other side, you have many different cars and form factors. And in the middle, you have many different locales where these products are being used. That's hard, right? But the good news is, again, is like Android Auto put many, many people hours into engineering components that can be reused across these different form factors. So hopefully, as a maker of apps and services, you are shielded from that kind of complexity. And so you know, this, this, this speaks to that point that I was just making. Basically, it's, you know, the common platform is important because we can't ask you to create an application or a different application or design for every different car type out there. That wouldn't be nearly impossible, right? And so we're trying to help with the standardization across these things. And so finally, as designers of that system, we have a lot of responsibility. So first, to um, you guys, the developers and makers of things, that you, the apps continue to work on the system no matter what future car con UI configuration the manufacturers will come up with. And then finally, to the driver, that they get to use their stuff, their content, on all these different cars, and doing so in a responsible manner. And then finally, to the car manufacturer, that they, can, and they get an ecosystem of apps that they can use to augment their car experience. Right, and as German just mentioned, we have this responsibility to the driver. And part of that responsibility is understanding that humans simply aren't as capable inside the car when they're driving. We're just not as good at interacting with technology because we have this competing safety critical activity that we have to pay attention to. So we have to be very careful and weigh things very carefully, every design decision against the implications of the effects and the, the, the effects that it might have on human performance. Um, and there's this critical balance here, um, essentially one of the cruxes of really developing experiences inside the car is how can you deliver a positive user experience while at the same time making sure that we're not overtaxing the driver. And that leads us to this very typical process uh, of research and design. So this is a pretty common uh, iterative cycle that you see in most development cycles. But I point it out because it's really absolutely critical for our team uh, to have this close hand-in-hand -hand process. Um, and we really overly invest in research, in, the, in our research, uh, because distraction is such a critical issue. So we need this tightly coupled process uh, between the two because it really helps to facilitate rapid design and helps us to head in the right direction early on rather than having to course correct later on when it's more costly. And that leads us more or less to trying to test everything. So um, a lot of the principles and the patterns that you see from Android Auto uh, aren't a random set of ideas and theories that we've just arrived at. They're the result of a highly iterative process that's predominantly led by vast amounts of user testing. And so we rigorously test again and again as much as we can. And we have a lot of tools and methods that we use, both on the qualitative side and the quantitative side. Um, but rather than dwell on this slide, I'll go to the next one. 
So we have this quick video, which is from uh, Nat and Lowe. And who's, is anybody familiar with Nat and Lowe? So, okay, a few people. So Nat Lowe is this YouTube channel. It's a couple Googlers that uh, go around Google and they film kind of behind the scenes action of different projects and things happening at Google. And then they post it on their, their YouTube channel. So they recently stopped by Android Auto to check out our research lab. Um, I'm not gonna play the whole clip, but I, I recommend everybody go and check that out. But instead I have some quick clips that I'll talk over. So we can go ahead and play the video. And this is just to show some of the different research activities that we do. So there's their startup, and then there's Nat and Low. It's really Low and Nat in that order. Uh, okay, so we have driving simulators. So this is one of our driving simulators. Um, and basically what you see is it's a, you know, it's a representation of a car inside of our, our lab and allows us to put participants inside a fake car, but give them this really immersive environment as they drive. Um, and as they do this, we'll give them tasks in Android Auto to perform. And so as they try and drive and complete tasks, we then look at their driving performance and evaluate how much does their driving performance degrade. And that's an indicator of if we need to redesign or not, if something's overly distracting. Beyond the simulator, we also have, uh, we, we look at eye tracking as well. So as I mentioned before, visual distraction is really critical. So here's one of our eye trackers. It of course tracks the eye, um, and it gives us a quantitative assessment of natural glance behavior inside the car. So we use this again paired with the simulator to have them engage with tasks in Android Auto as they have to also drive. And that helps us to determine how people make glances. And if, the, if we find that people have to make too long of glances, that's an indicator that it's overly distracting and we need to go back and redesign. And we also look at cognitive measurement. This is a little bit harder to assess, but this is detection response task, DRT. And basically she's putting a micro switch on her finger. That's a little button that she can click. And then she also has a tactor that gets taped. We tape it around the neck area, and that vibrates on a random frequency, a random interval. And once she feels the vibration, she has to acknowledge it with the button. And basically, this is a really rudimentary way to black box the brain and look at the phase delay of cognitive processing. We can start to evaluate, relative to other tasks, how distracting something is from the cognitive aspect. Then we have occlusion goggles. These are these really goofy looking goggles and they cycle between fully opaque and fully transparent. And it's just a really quick, easier way to simulate a dual task environment uh, for evaluating whether a task can be completed within a reasonable time and whether or not a task is chunkable. Thanks, Greg, that was really great. Um, we have a little bit of time left to talk about implications for the future and the areas we're interested in um, in terms of future. And also you can't have a presentation about cars without talking about the future, I guess. Um, we're really at the beginning of this journey right. where we're starting to understand that bringing two industries together, us sort of from the internet and, and, and you know, develop a community and, and make of apps and, and Google. And on the other side, the automotive industry, which has much longer development cycles, you know, between car cycles, sometimes seven years and more. But the, we are really understanding the thoroughness that they put into the process is actually essential because they're building huge machinery. It's actually a very non-trivial problem. And at the same time, they are learning from us as we are sort of doing, going through more rapid iterations of things. And both of these things coming together is, is starting to be a really interesting uh, mix and a new pos potential um, for developing things that weren't here yet before. And we are starting to see also that the automotive UX that we're building we're starting to apply this to other areas within Android because we're, we're having some very interesting learnings. One area that we want to look at in the, in the near future is that we're very interested in new types of applications that haven't yet been covered, where you know, there's innovative areas like car health, driving monitoring, um, new forms of car ownership, you know, or even professional drivers that require new types of apps. So in this case, for example, an EV manufacturer might be really interested in talking about how their batteries are doing and, and things like that. So we're starting to think about apps in the car also as something that goes overall to Android 
as morphable apps, morphable systems that can take different shapes. And that's something we're learning as we're building Android Auto that might apply to future in other form factors. Different shapes depending on what the context is and what your cognitive, uh, your cognitive ability is. And so this is something that, that's completely new. Another thing that I love about designing for cars is that it's really sort of a greenhouse, a very defined environment. Everything has its place. It's very heavily constrained. And so we can, we can start experimenting and learning from things. As people are sitting in these positions, there's clearly a driver, a passenger, maybe passengers in the back. They all have their roles. And so we're starting to learn how we organize the system, optimize for these specific roles. And we can do this in the car much better than we can sort of do this in freeform environment like the phone or the TV. Another area that we're very interested in is kind of thinking beyond just the in-cabin experience. Because when you think about it, as Greg was mentioning before, there's really a pre-drive experience and there's a post-drive experience that's very important to us that really makes this, this the whole holistic experience. But also think of it as a scale thing. You know, you have your phone, but the, your phone is inside a car which has multiple phones, and then the car drives inside an interconnected system of cities and, and highways. And each presents a new connected opportunity to innovate in. One example is um, that, for example, in maps, you see the green, red, yellow of traffic. And this is something where sort of small units of information get put together to form uh, useful information for all the drivers. And we believe that every major change in transportation has fundamentally changed the infrastructure. Um, you know, trading, uh, notions of scale, the way we build and the way we organize our cities. And we believe that this next thing, the content connected entities that cars are, will change that yet once again. And cars, it's interesting because when we looked at it 10 years ago, cars were really super optimized. They had the engines optimized and all this other stuff. But as people are using phones in different ways and as people are using connectivity in different ways, they have, as Greg pointed out, expectations of how they can also use this in the car as they're spending more and more time in the car. And so this is very clear that this is a brand new platform, and we think about computing in a very different way. And so as, as we think about this, it's become very clear to us that cars, connected cars do become a thing unto themselves. You know, as, as in the past, um, when mobile phones first came out, people tried to shoehorn the PC interfaces into mobile by just shrinking it, right? It was a bad idea. So the phone has come a long way to sort of develop its own, own interface. And real change will happen to the car UIs. They're not just smartphone interfaces that are a little bit blown up, but they will happen as cars become their own connected thing in themselves. And so um, we're almost at the end of this talk. And um, if you remember only two things from this talk, um, we want you to take away this. First thing is, um, we, we, we really learned that we needed a completely different model for the UI to get designed for, drive, um, designed for driving optimized. And the second thing is that Android, as an operating system, and, and speci specifically Android Auto, helps you with building the, some of this expertise directly into the building blocks you get to use for making applications. And this is a long process because of all the safety and driver distraction implication. We have to very thoroughly test all this stuff. But the, the future is very exciting, where we, as, as an operating system, also starting to learn to sort of almost morph and adapt the UI to new constraints and to future form factors that we haven't even thought about. And believe me, there's some crazy stuff out there that we see at auto shows where there's screens like, you know, hugely wide. And, and normal computing environment, normal adaptive responsive design doesn't even follow this and, and wouldn't have a response to that. So we're only at the beginning of this evolution, and we see this as the starting point. And we can't wait to see what, together, you and us will build um, from this going forward. Thank cool. you very much for coming. Thank you.